For today's sermon, I would like to begin with something, and it's a poem, and just a fair warning. Um, for some of you, this may be emotional. It certainly struck me emotionally um, for different reasons as a father, and so just wanted to give fair warning that if this strikes a chord or is difficult for you to hear, it, it has to do with relating to a father and some brokenness that I certainly did not intend to wound you as a pastor for no reason. And um, I think the time we're done with the sermon today, you'll understand why we began this way. But just wanted to let you know there's nothing graphic in it or anything like that. But it could be difficult if you uh, have a rough relationship with your father. Um, today we're talking about a heavenly father. I found another poem from a daughter to her father. Um, the name on it was just Stephanie, no one I know, no one here, for all intents and purposes, is anonymous, but it was the words of a broken daughter to her father, and it said this, My heart aches, Dad, for the things you won't do. My soul breaks, Dad, for all that we've been through. I fear it's not too late, Dad, to mend my broken heart. I'm so full of hate, Dad, I don't know where to start. You took away my hope, Dad, that I would ever be loved. I know I'm left to cope, Dad, and I watch you love, as I watch you love your son. I want to scream and yell, Dad, but I fear my voice will crack. I want to so much to tell you, Dad, that I can't always take you back. Please listen to my words, Dad, for they're all that I can say. I want you to treat me like I'm yours, Dad, and not just throw me away. Fathers play a huge role in our life. We live in a broken world with broken fathers, which leads to broken families and broken children. And I couldn't but help but think so we start today, we talk about our Heavenly Father. There is no doubt that your relation to Him has been affected by whatever relationship you have to your Father, your earthly Father. And I would just like to start by saying whatever that relationship is, good or bad, broken, non-existent, or very well, that when it comes to our Heavenly Father, He is everything our earthly fathers could not exactly be. He is perfect. He is good. He does not fail us. He does not break his family. He always keeps his promises. And so as we enter into a broken world that really has a broken view of fatherhood, I think it's important for us to just start to recognize that and to say, let's look at what our father has told us about himself, our heavenly father and what he is like, and how he is committed to us, and what role that he plays in our life. And so today, in the sermon, we're going to see the passages, or see the passage, and it's going to give three reasons to bless, and why our Father is blessed. That this passage is to say, it starts with, our blessed Father. And so it's going to give us three reasons to bless that blessed Father. Let's read our passage for today. If you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Ephesians. It's a small book towards the end of your Bible, and we're going to be in chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. And this is what it tells us about our Heavenly Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And so today, the sermon's called Our Blessed Father, and he has tremendously blessed us. And so we have three reasons in this passage to bless him back today. 
And the first one starts in verse 3. And Miles, if you could go ahead and go to the next slide for me. I only got three slides, so I think you can handle it today. But uh, you can go to the first point, which is bless our Father because he has united us to Christ. One reason you have to bless our Father is because he has united us to Christ. And so this passage begins in verse 3 saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And really, in the original language, it just describes God as being blessed. Which is actually a very interesting thought, because we always typically think of God as blessing others. But yet in the scriptures, in the Old Testament and the New, often they describe God himself as being blessed. And what that means is literally in the language, it meant that God is worthy of being spoken well of. It has this very similar origin to the word we use in English of eulogy. Usually, G begins with the Greek U, which means good, and attaches the logia, which is a word that means words. And so it literally means a eulogy, to speak good words about somebody. And the idea of being blessed here, when it comes to God, carries a similar thing, that he is praiseworthy. He is worthy to be praised, that we should speak about him, even in the children's gospel, that we should sing about him, that the whole earth should praise him. And so the scriptures tell us our Father, our God, is blessed. He is worthy of being spoken of and praiseworthy for all that he has done. And the first thing we learn that God has done in turning and blessing us, we bless him for who he is, but we also bless him for what he has done. But our father in heaven is blessed and he blesses us. And so the first way he has blessed us, it says, who has blessed us in Christ. Christ is the means by which the Father has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, which is to say every kind of blessing that he gives us from the heavenly places comes to us through Christ. And the essence of what it means to be a Christian, as Paul starts with this, remember he talks about the saints, and the saints are those who are in Christ and believe in Christ, is really this, to have God as your Father, to have Jesus as your Lord. That's what Jesus taught us to pray, our Father. As Christians, that's what we pray. That's the appropriate way we address God in our prayers. But we pray in Jesus' name because ultimately he is our Lord and he is the means by which God's promises and God's goodness and God's blessing comes to us. And so we ask God to answer our prayers in Jesus' name because ultimately he is our Father and Jesus is our Lord. And the thing is, some people in history, I don't know if you've been around, but through the 80s and 90s, you might have heard people say some things like, well, Jesus is my Savior, but he's not really my Lord. And I'm here to tell you, church, that's not right. That's not correct. It cannot work that way. The Bible says, look, we don't make Jesus Lord. He is Lord. The only question is whether you recognize whether he's Lord or not. And so if Jesus is your Savior, he must also be your Lord. That's exactly what Paul says in Romans 10, 9 through 10. He says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is what? Is Savior? Not exactly. He says, if Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. In the early church, and certainly for the Ephesians, there was a struggle because there was a well-known thing happening in the Roman Empire. And that thing was that the emperor was oftentimes to be worshipped. There were statues of him. There was a whole cult dedicated to the emperor. And the primary phrase that people would have to confess is that the emperor, whoever he was, was Lord. And the early Christian church did not want to say that because they knew the emperor is not Lord. He is not God. Jesus is Lord. And they were persecuted for it. And so if you are a Christian here today, you cannot say that, yes, Jesus has saved me, but I don't submit to him. Yes, Jesus has saved me, but I don't obey him. Those things go together as we submit to him. 
and we love him. That's who the Father has appointed for us to obey. And even Jesus says in the Gospel of John, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And so there is a relationship where, yes, our obedience does not dictate whether we are accepted by Christ, but it is evidence of whether we really know Christ and that he is our Lord. And so God has blessed us and he has put us in Christ. But it's worth taking a moment for us to sit here and meditate on this phrase, in Christ. You're going to see it all over Ephesians. We talked about it as one of our themes. You're going to see in him or in Christ, especially in this first section of Ephesians. What does Paul exactly mean by that? He obviously doesn't mean we're literally standing in Jesus' body or something like that. So what does Paul mean when he tells these Christians, these Ephesians, that they're in Christ? He's not talking about their physical location, but their spiritual position and relationship with God. He's talking about their spiritual position before God. And so to help understand this a little bit better, I think what we have to talk about is how God appointed two persons throughout the scripture. And so we go all the way back to Genesis, and there's the first man that God made. His name was Adam. And Adam, the scripture tells us, was a sort of representative of humanity. He was a figurehead that represented us all. Whatever Adam did was determinative of how humanity would go in its relationship with God. And so God appointed to Adam to sort of as the first man act on behalf of humanity. And so the first representative human was Adam. But then there was a second representative that comes, and it's Jesus Christ. And so in the scriptures, Adam and Jesus represent two groups in humanity. And while Adam chose to rebel against God, to not obey, to eat of the tree of God that God commanded him not to do, that was the real essence of his sin. It wasn't just the eating from the tree. It was Adam in his thinking and in his determining saying, God, you are not king. I am king. And I will do what I want. I don't care that you have told me no. That's the essence of Adam's sin. But then there is another, even the Bible calls him in Corinthians, the last Adam who comes who is another representative of humanity, and he is Jesus. And he succeeds where Adam failed. That he obeys the Father perfectly. He submits to God. He does what Adam did not do. And so the scriptures tell us spiritually there are only two kinds of people in this world. Those who are spiritually in Adam or those who are spiritually in Christ. Either Adam represents you before God in some way as you're connected to him or Christ represents you before God. And we are naturally born into Adam, which is why the Bible tells us we are born with sinful natures and we are sinful. It is natural for us to want to rebel and do wrong. Because we are born naturally connected to Adam, and that's what Adam has given us as an inheritance. But then when we go over here to Christ, that as someone is, as we talk about as Christian, reborn spiritually, John 3, uh, Jesus talks about a spiritual rebirth. You are reborn connected to a different person, to Christ. And whatever Christ accomplished, he accomplished also on your behalf. And so we're only in one of two categories. If you don't know Christ and you're not a Christian, you are spiritually in Adam and connected to Adam, and you are in rebellion against God and stuck in your sinful nature. But if you are in Christ, you have a renewed nature. You are reborn into a different type of humanity that God is making through Jesus Christ. And so that is what Paul says about, means about being in Christ. And so the Bible has a term to refer to this representation and its headship or being a head. And the idea as headship is that there's an individual who represents or carries consequences on behalf of a group. And Texans, it's, this is so easy because you guys have an analogy for this that all of you are going to get. And you know that if you've ever watched football, 
on TV. You know it if you've ever played football, because think about for this of it. We have a type of headship or representation like this in our culture. I'm sure you can find other things. Uh, but when you're on a football team and someone scores a touchdown, he scores a touchdown for who? The whole team gets accounted for that credit of that player scoring a touchdown. If one player gets a penalty, who gets penalized? That one player? No. The whole team gets penalized on the field. Why? Because that team member as a single person is representative of the team. And the scriptures are teaching something very similar about Adam or Christ. You are either on Adam's team or you are on Christ's team. And whenever those two individuals have done affect you and have consequences for you. So if you are in Adam, you receive what Adam has passed to you. If you are in Christ, you receive what Christ passes to you. And while Adam passes on sin, Christ passes on forgiveness of sin and righteousness ultimately in him. And so the question for us is, how do we know if like these Ephesians, I'm in Christ or if I'm in Adam? And I think it's good for us to go for a cross reference for this. And I realized I forgot to put the references, and so I'm going to have to post them later. You're going to have to come ask me exact references of these because I forget them in my head, but I assure you they're in the scriptures. And so Paul elsewhere talks about the works of the flesh, that if we're in Adam, we're in the flesh. And what is it? How do we know whether we're in the flesh or not? Well, he says the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul isn't saying someone has to be perfect. But if those things dominate your life, if that is the pattern of your life, then you should be asking the question, am I really in Christ? Do I really have fruit in my life, in my spirit that is different than this? Because if this is the fruit of your life, if this is what your life is dominated by and categorized by, you are in Adam. You are not in Christ. But Paul, in that same passage in Galatians, says this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Those who are in Christ have taken the flesh and as best they can in the spirit's power, they are crucifying and they understand the payment for those sins were nailed to a cross and they're changing and they're repenting and they're heading towards God and towards Christ. But they're also doing something. They're loving. They're having joy. They're having peace. They're having patience. They're having kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If those things categorize you in your life, you have good evidence, good support, good security to know that you are in Christ. But ask yourself, which of these dominate my life? Am I in Christ or I am, am I in Adam? And it is only those in Christ that have Christ as their head, as their representative before the Father, and receive the spiritual blessings listed here. And so the spiritual blessings that Paul is talking about is for Christians, is for the saints, is for those who are being in Christ. But the good news for you today, that if you're someone who's not in Christ, you can be. The Bible tells you if you repent of your sin and trust in Christ, you will be united to Christ. But the gospel commands you turn from your sin, turn from your rebellion, turn from your connection to Adam, and instead be united to Christ to be in Christ. And if you're someone here today who wants to know more about that or to make a decision, I invite you today after the sermon, I'll be right here and I would love to talk to you about that. And even if it's not me, find someone in this room that says, I know I'm in Christ and I know Jesus and tell me how this can be done. And so being in Christ is both a spiritual blessing in itself, because that's where the Father has put us, and also a means by which God brings every single blessing to us as a believer. 
And so these are blessings that we currently have that we don't need to strive to obtain, Christian. And as we go through Ephesians, and especially these spiritual blessings listed at first, no, these are not things that you have to work for. If you are in Christ, they are yours. And if you're not accessing them, if you're not using them, if you're not relying on them, then it is to your own detriment because they belong to you. You are stifling yourself. Good illustration from John MacArthur's commentary gives an example of this woman. Her name is Hattie Green. She was called America's greatest reluctant spender. When she died in 1916, she left an estate valued at $100 million and especially vast fortune of that day. I would say it's a vast fortune of today, too. (laughs) But she was so reluctant to spend money that she ate cold oatmeal in order to save the expense of heating the water. When her son had a severe leg injury, she took so long trying to find a free clinic to treat him that his leg ended up having to be amputated. And apparently, she brought about and hastened her own death while arguing that the merits of skim milk were better than that of whole milk because it was cheaper. This woman had access to resources, but she didn't use them, and not for the right purposes. If you don't use the spiritual blessings listed in Ephesians, you will be like this woman. You will be crippled in your spiritual growth, You will be limited in your ability to help others, and you will not realize God's treasure trove of blessing. It's not like he's going to run out. (laughs) It's not like it's going to be gone. And so Paul's purpose through Ephesians is to help the Ephesians and say, take hold of these blessings, Ephesians. They belong to you and use them in your life to minister to others, to love one another, to reach the community with the gospel, to fight the sins of your former life as you put on the new man and you become a new person and you crucify the flesh. Use these spiritual blessings and know, first of all, that you are united to Christ. You belong to him. You are righteous in him. You are forgiven in him. And through him, I have blessed you with everything. And so we bless our Father because he has united us to Christ as our head and our representative. How? By God's grace. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. Like Adam, we rebelled. We were against God. And yet God was so gracious and he said, I'm going to give you something you don't deserve. And that's to be united to my son. If you would only recognize and confess your sin for what it is, rebellion against a good and perfect king, a good and perfect father. And trust in my son that he has paid your penalty. But next, our father is to be blessed because he has chosen you in Christ. So not only has God given us every spiritual blessing in Christ, one of those spiritual blessings, verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. It is a blessing to you that you have been chosen in Christ. Notice it says, before the foundation of the world, before God created every, anything, if you are in Christ, God thought of you and determined, you will be in my son. You will be connected to him. I will have mercy and I will have grace upon you and you will come to him. God is not reactive in his plan of salvation. He is not, the sin didn't happen and God was like, oh no, what do I do? My plans were messed up. He knew what would happen. He knew what we would need and he was proactive in his determining, in his choice and said, no, I will not just condemn my creation. I am merciful and I will grace and I will redeem it. I will bring those who need to be in Christ. And so God chose to redeem us from sin. And the text tells us why or how we should be. To be holy, to be blameless. And depending on your translation, I think it's better said to be loving before him. To be loving before him. Holy because we've been set apart by our heavenly father if we're Christians. That's what it means to be holy. To be set apart for a unique person and say, God, God has said, in Christ, I have set you apart from the rest of the world and I have made you mine. 
And I expect you to conduct yourself in a way that reflects who I am about your new nature, being new in Christ and being different than what your old life is. And so as you're converted, you should see a difference in your life. The paradoxical thing about being a Christian church is as you grow as a Christian, you should see less sin in your life and more good works. But simultaneously, you will realize you're a worse sinner than you ever thought when you were first converted. And that's why the gospel is even for Christians too. That we need to preach it to ourselves and tell it to ourselves that when we mess up, when we sin, when we go back to the flesh, when we submit ourselves back to sin... That we say, this is all the more reason I needed Christ in the first place. Praise God. Praise the Father that I'm in Christ. And that my eternity is dependent on what Christ did in his performance and not my performance. And that my faith and trust was in him and his righteousness, not what I do in my righteousness and my goodness. We are blameless because we do not have our sins held against us in Christ. That's what God promises. Our sins have been nailed to a cross. God has already poured out his wrath. God has no wrath, no angry disposition towards anyone who is in Christ. He is always close to them, always loves them. You may feel otherwise, but it has not changed an ounce, Christian. When you sin or when you veer from God, certainly there is a... Uh, a sense in which you know you are convicted and it's difficult for you to relate with your father, but know that your father has not changed in loving you an ounce because he was never basing his relationship with you off of what you did and didn't do, but what his son did for you. And so we are blameless, not because we are perfect, but because no one can rightly bring an accusation Before God against the Christian, because ultimately the Christian's sins have been forgiven. Those in Christ have been forgiven and that they have been given the very righteousness of Christ. And that is what makes them blameless before the father. It's not their own goodness, their own sense of morality. It's that God has chosen to treat them like Christ because they have trusted in Christ as their substitute to die and live in their place. And lastly, depending on what your translation says, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky as a pastor, and it's helpful to learn a little bit of the original Greek language, if you don't know, in the New Testament. The original Bible is written in Greek, and in Greek there is no punctuation. There's no period marks, and in fact, there wasn't even spaces between the words. It's just letters. So sometimes it's not to be alarmed. There's just a question of, of, of where does this word fit? There's an adjective. What word is it describing? If it's a verb, who's performing the action of this verb? And in this case, as best I can tell you, church, your translation might end with, in verse 4, saying that we should be holy and blameless before him, period. In love, he predestined us. It's actually, I think, meant to be connected that we are holy and blameless. That it's describing that as God put us in Christ, we are to walk in love. We'll reflect the Father of love as he has loved us. And so as God has loved us in Christ, God calls us to love others. As God has called us in Christ, he calls us to love others. So then God has made a choice, and that choice has been to forgive you of your sins, to transform you from a rebellious sinner connected with Adam to an obedient saint. Holy, blameless, loving, because you belong to Jesus Christ. And so you should bless your father because he has chosen you in Christ. He has chosen to set his affection, his mercy, and his grace upon you. But lastly today, we see a third blessing. Bless our father because he has adopted you through Christ. Verse 5, it says, He predestined us for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And I'll just throw it out there. I'm sure many of you, any of you who have been church for a long time are already thinking, what the heck is Jordan going to say about predestination right now? What's his view? What does that word mean? And let me tell you something right now. 
While I'm sure many of you have questions about that, and you will hear me preach from this pulpit, I'm not afraid of that topic. It's right here in the Bible, regardless of what you believe about what it is. The word predestination is in the scripture. And so we have to wrestle with it. But I don't think Paul's point, which going back to our first sermon, remember, we try to think what was the author's intention? was here in this place in Scripture to explain how predestination works and answer those objections. If you want to talk about that, when we get to Romans 9 and I preach on it, that's the sermon to talk about. How does this work? But the question is, why does Paul mention predestination here, a destiny being determined beforehand? And so I would just like to say a couple things. First of all, the Scriptures clearly teach God both predestines and we are responsible for our choices. How the two do go together, like I said, that's a day for another sermon at another time. Or if you want to come and talk to me, I'm open to that. And we'll open up the scriptures and we'll talk about what does that look like. But they teach both. And we have to hold those in tension. And as Christians, there's lots of things we hold in tension like that. Jesus is man and fully God. How do those two things go together? I'm a saint and a sinner at the same time. How do those things go together? I'm in Christ, and yet sometimes it seems I return to a temporary slavery of sort of giving into my flesh. Well, how does that work? As Christians, there's lots of things we hold in tension. Get used to it. We don't know the detail of everything and every time. God is three in one. There are three persons in one God. There's some things that the scriptures do tell us, but we don't know everything. And so we have to learn to be comfortable with the tension at times, church. We have to learn to be comfortable with that tension. So going back to my original question, why does Paul really bring it up here? Because he he doesn't address it like he does in Romans 9. Romans 9, he addressed all the questions you guys got. How does that work? Like, how does God predetermine? But I have choices. Do I still have free will? Paul addresses that in Romans 9, but he doesn't hear I think Paul's mention of predestination here is an emphasis on the what and not the who. It's an emphasis on the what, not the who. That is, Paul is emphasizing what God has done in predestining us and to what end more than he's trying to adjust how it works or who it's about. And so what he's saying is, is God was under no obligation to adopt us. Or to bring salvation in any way. The question that should press upon you, church, is not how could God create people knowing they're going to hell, but how could God be so merciful that we live in a world that he didn't rightly condemn all of us? It would have been perfectly in God's right to do that, to save no human being. We didn't earn any of it, and yet he was so gracious and so merciful. He chose to extend mercy to us through Christ, and that it is truly available to anybody who wants it. That anybody who repents and wants to come to Christ can. The scriptures tell us that. And he has offered us that in Christ. And so I think Paul's focus here on the predestined is this is a loving, gracious act of God. He could have just said, I'm done. Adam sinned, Adam rebelled, I gave him a choice, and humanity is done. I'm just going to, like the flood, I'm done. They're all done, but yet he was gracious and he was merciful to us. And so we should praise God for that. God, you could have condemned me, but you didn't. You reached into my life when I was a rebel, and you saved me, and you changed my heart to turn to you, Lord. And so when it comes to predestination, I encourage you, don't take it as something to foul you up. Take it as an encouragement to your life. Think about what that means. That thing means when you're evangelizing, God just tells you, be faithful. Preach the gospel. Let me change their heart. But I will use you as an instrument to bring the gospel to them. That's what Paul says in Romans 10. How will they come to belief in Christ if someone doesn't preach it to them and tell it to them? How will they hear without a preacher? And he doesn't mean just me sitting here in the pulpit. He means the church bringing the word of God to people and preaching the gospel. Take an encouragement, Christian, because it means that your salvation is secure and cannot be lost. That it's not you who sustains yourself. It is God who sustains you. And he is predetermined for eternity's past. You are mine and I am never letting you go. 
And take it as a encouragement because if you speak to other people, there is no one, absolutely no one too far gone. No matter how dirty their sin is, no matter what they're in, God is so amazing and so miraculous that he can reach into their life and change them. But he wants to use you to do that as well. As you are faithful to love that person, to encourage them, and to change them. But Paul says God did something very specific here. He predestined us for adoption through himself, which is amazing. Adoption is the doctrine. I don't know if I got this from someone else or I made it up. Most pastors, we get a lot of things from other guys. Uh, but it's, it's like the doctrine, the belief of grace within grace. Think about this for a moment. God could have accomplished everything he did in sending Jesus, dying for our sins, living the life we can live, pouring out his wrath on the cross, forgiving us, making us in Christ without necessarily adopting us. Think about it in human terms. Uh, you know, you adopt someone into your family. You could have someone who lives and comes around your family and you could treat them like a son without actually making them your son. You could say, I'm going to love you, I'm going to care for you, I'm going to give you all the benefits, I'm going to help pay for you, I'm going to educate you, whatever it is it may be, and treat them like a son. But it's something else to say, you're mine. You belong in this family. You are as a legitimate son as the one that was born to me. You are as legitimate as anyone else, and you will bear our family name, and you will resemble us. And that's what God did for us. It's not that he just wanted to be good to us. He wanted us to be his and to say, you are as a legitimate son or daughter to me as my firstborn son, Jesus Christ. And I have made you my son or my daughter. And so it's an amazing doctrine that God adopted us. This is the very reason why I adopted a son in my own family. I saw the clear parallels with this doctrine that even though every Christian is not obligated or necessarily should adopt if there's any group of people in the world who could take adoption seriously or have thinking about it it's christians because we know spiritually what has happened to us before god and so god has brought us into his family and made us his own but then something surprising happens in verse six why did god do that according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glory, of his grace. God did this for his own glory. And I'm going to challenge you, church, to think about something for a moment. I'm going to say a sentence, and I'm hoping to explain it a little more. Here's a twist. Here's something that's unique about the God of the scriptures, about the God we worship. This God is the one being in all the universe that self exaltation for him is an act of love you ever thought about that it's a non-christian if you read the bible maybe you've heard non-christians say this god seems really selfish the whole world is mine and it all belongs to me worship me praise me all these things and even if you've read someone like c.s lewis before when he was a non-christian he thought to himself what is god like an old lady who like needs vain compliments this is weird But think about this for a moment. In scripture and in culture, we throw around the word love a lot. Well, in the scriptures and when it talks of God's love, it talks about a specific type of love. The Greek word is agape. It always describes God's love as being agape. The essence, and there was other words for love. Love for, for how you love your friend, for how you love someone you're romantically interested in. There's different words to describe those things. But it always describes God's love as agape. What does agape mean? Agape communicated the sense of love of wholly giving yourself to another. I find my joy, I find my value in building this person up, in sacrificing for them, in loving them, and caring for them. It's agape love is entirely invested in the good of the other person, even if it comes to me at great cost. I'm going to do whatever it is to love this person, even if it costs me. So the question is, what is the most loving thing, the most loving gift that God could have given us? It's himself. 
What could God give in that was greater than himself? We want goodness. We want perfection. We want faithfulness. We want loyalty. We want to be lavished with kindness and love. And God says, guess what? I'm the pinnacle of all that. For lack of a better sentence, God is sort of stuck being the most awesome person in the universe, and it actually would have been less loving for him to give us anything but himself. And that is the true essence of the gospel. Yes, you repent and have faith in Christ, and you're forgiven, and you're made righteous, and you have these spiritual blessings, but ultimately the real goal, the real reason God did all these things is because he wants to have a relationship with you, and he made you in such a way the most joyous, the most content. The greatest you can be is in Christ and knowing him. And we know that in our human terms. If you ever get in a fight with a friend or your wife or your husband, it's not just the benefits that you want back of that relationship. I want to go out to dinner. I want to do romantic things, whatever it may be. It's I want my wife back. I want my husband back. I want my friend back. And God is the same way. He says, I want my child back. I want my image bearer back. And I want to be in a relationship with them. That is what God is doing. And so we need not be alarmed when, every, when God does everything for his own glory, for his own being known. Because really, he's loving us in doing that. And that's why the Bible tells we shouldn't be selfish. We shouldn't exalt ourselves because we are not God. But for him to do that is to point us in the direction of the most loving and satisfying being there ever has been. And to be in a relationship with him. And so that's what God wants. Later, we're going to read in Ephesians 2. Before we were in Christ, we were what? Children of wrath. God was angry with us. He was wrathful towards us, and he was rightfully so. He's a good God, and he will punish sin. See, everyone thinks there's a problem with the world. The problem is they never think it's them. We are the problem with the world. You are the problem with this world because of your sin, and you are a sinner. And God rightly rightly punishes sin and sinners because he is a just God, and he is a good God. And yet he is also loving and gracious and because of his forgiveness in christ and being united to christ we can have a relationship with our perfect loving and gracious father again and it's all possible because this loving father has put you in christ has chosen you in christ and adopted you into his family christian if you are in christ you are his son You are his daughter. There is nothing, no good thing he holds back from you. Whatever you're going through, whatever sin, whatever struggle, whatever suffer, he has not left you. He has not abandoned you. He is near to you. And he, like I said, has not changed his disposition at all because you belong to him and you are his son or daughter. And so we started today with a poem. Broken daughter to her father who was obviously a very flawed very sinful man and probably very broken himself but as we conclude i'd like to read another poem to you it comes from our heavenly father and it's right there in the scriptures if you would just read it but what i'm going to do church is just close your eyes for a moment And listen to these words from the Bible as they're strung together. The words of a blessed father to his children. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose to make you mine before I created anything or anyone. I knit you together in your mother's womb. You are made in my image. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are not a mistake. For all the days of your life are written in my book. I brought you forth on the day that you were born. You are my son. You are my daughter. For my firstborn son, by his blood, has made you my son and made you my daughter forever. I have put away your sin never to return, nailed to a cross. 
Therefore, I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. I will always hear you and listen. Nothing will separate you from my love. I know everything about you. I'm familiar with all your ways. I see you when you sit down, and I see you when you get up. I know your thoughts. I am not distant or angry, but I am always near to you. My discipline will never be from anger, but always only from love. For I am your perfect father. I have provided and will always provide for your needs because I love you with an everlasting love. I will always be for you and never against you. I will always work things out for your good. I will forever comfort and establish you. When you are brokenhearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. I rejoice over you with singing. One day my son Jesus will wipe away every tear from your eyes and he will remove all pain and suffering from this earth. I am your father and I love you as I love my only begotten. Praise God for our blessed father. Let's pray.